excited to be here with you this morning. Thank you so much for having us. Thank you for inviting us. And you've been also uh, loving and welcoming to my, my wife and I. And uh, it's a privilege to talk to you today. So as, uh, as Craig said, we lead a church called 614 Church. It's a telephone area code in a, in a city in the U.S. called Columbus, Ohio. Uh, kind of easy. So our church is nine years old. And we're also a very young church. We're just a few blocks away from a university called Ohio State University, 65,000 students just a few blocks away from us. So we have a lot of young people in our church right now. It's something like 62% of our church is 25 or younger. So it's a lot of fun. That means the energy is high, tithing is low. (laughs) (laughs) So Steve, you're coming. You're you're coming to... (laughs) In the last 18 months, uh, I've officiated 15 weddings, so we do a lot of dancing, and we like it. We have a lot of fun. I want to talk today about building with the next generation. Building with the next generation, they are not the future, they are the present. They're here with us, and we are building with the next generation, and it's important for us to do so. So just to know who I have here, anyone over 30 Uh, Under 30, can you stand up, please? We're good. You may may sit down. I wanted you to stand up because if I said if you're over 30 to stand up, it would take a long time. So. Our church is nine years old. For the first seven years of our church, um, no one joined the church who was a Christian who had had any leadership before. And I kept praying, God, would you send us someone who's done this before? Because we don't know what we're doing. So we're going to try our best. Send us someone. And year after year, it was just people getting saved in the church or people who were saved who had never had any leadership. And God told us, you need to make leaders. Stop waiting for them. Make them. Because God has given people into your church. You are in your church. You are a building stone. You are a living stone. You are a part of the answer for your city and for your church. So if you're in that church, God has something for you to do there, to contribute there. Amen? Uh, I just want to acknowledge our translators. Thank you so much. Can we hear it for them? When I listen to podcasts, I do it at 1.5 speed. So I talk at 1.5 speed. If I go too fast, just put your hands up, and I'll slow it down. Thank you so much. So our church is young. Um, A disclaimer, before I talk about some of the things we learned as we led this church with a lot of young people, we never tried to be a young church. We just wanted to be a church. We wanted to reach the people in our community. It so happened that a lot of them are young. So don't try to build a young church. Try to build the church that Jesus is building and partner with him and use everyone that is in your church. Amen? Good. So four things I want to highlight from lessons that we've learned as we've been building with young people. The first one is this. It's authenticity. Authenticity. Young people today want authenticity. They want to see that what you're doing, you actually mean it, you actually believe it, and you're not just going through the actions. Acts chapter 20, verse 18, when Paul brings together the elders from Ephesus, he calls them together and he teaches them on how to lead and how to shepherd. But in verse 18, he says this, you yourself know how I lived amongst you the whole time from the first day that I set foot in Asia. Serving the Lord with all humility and with tears and with trials that happened to me. Paul is saying, I wasn't fake. You know me. You know my life. You know what I did. And he showed he opened his whole life to the people that he was leading. We don't have to put up uh, facades so that people don't actually know the real you. Be real. Be authentic with the people in front of you. 
a Barna study last year on Gen Z, which is really this 25 and under uh, generation, the second biggest issue that Gen Zers talked about with their skepticism with Christianity was uh, inauthenticity. It was Christians are hypocrites. Christians are hypocrites. That's why they didn't want to join, because Christians would say one thing and do another thing. We need to be authentic. Do what you say. Say what you do. Let's be those who live our lives in front of our church. Other surveys on this generation show right now that this generation is very open to spirituality. They're very open to spirituality. We live in a city called Columbus. We're not in the Bible Belt of America. A little bit lower is the Bible Belt where people just go to church because you go to church. We have a very liberal university that we're with. And there's a lot of people who don't just go to church. They want to understand it. But they're hungry for something real. They're hungry for something deep and something spiritual. And guess what? We have the answer for them. We have the answer for them in what God is building in our churches. Right now, we have 40 to 50 people who show up every Wednesday morning at 7 a.m. for a prayer meeting. And 90% of them are in college. Young people are hungry for something to, uh, authentic. You don't have to water down what we're doing in our churches. You have to water down your life groups or your churches or your worship experiences. Give them all of Jesus. Amen? And being cool is not a prerequisite either. You guys look at me, I know, and you think, well, David, you are so cool. <laughs> so clearly. <laughs> I know you're not thinking that. It's got nothing to do with cool. Uh, you know, uh, last year, uh, a couple years ago, we had R.T. Kendall preach at our church. R.T. is 87 years old. Our 20-year-old said that that was the best message they've ever heard in their life that changed their lives. It's not about how cool you are. Another man, Ken Grenfell, preaches in our church quite a bit, and he's in his 70s now. He is the favorite in the church, and he is not cool but he is very authentic, very authentic, very powerful, and people love that, to see that. And just before I move on from authenticity, authentic doesn't mean sloppy, okay? Authentic, sometimes we use the word, I want to be organic or authentic when you haven't prepared. No one in this room, but maybe in other places. Excellence is a value. Excellence is a value. Let's bring our best to the Lord. Amen. Okay, second thing that we've learned along this journey is this idea of discipleship. Now, I, discipleship is a word, especially in our culture back home, everyone has a definition of what it is. Jesus teaches us really what the definition is. Matthew 28. Matthew 28, verse 18 through 20. Go into all the world, make disciples. Make disciples, make followers of Jesus. How? Baptizing them, uh, immersing them in everything about the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. He carries on. Teach them to observe or obey all that I've commanded you. What is discipleship? It is bringing people into a relationship with Jesus and then teaching them, uh, immersing them, in things of the Holy Spirit, immersing them in the heart of the Father, immersing them in the character and the nature of Jesus, and teaching them what Jesus said about tithing, what Jesus said about giving, about generosity, about marriage, teaching them all. That's, that's our goal, making disciples. What does that mean for young people? Well, here's a story. One of our elders right now, his name is Stacy. Stacy joined our church when he was 23 about seven, eight years ago. And he was on fire for the Lord, but he didn't know where to go. A lot of energy, just, oh, I'll do this, I'll do that. So he's like, okay, I want to go to, to, to Bible school. I'm going to go to Bible school in California. And he just joined the church. I said, okay, good. Bible school is great. That's wonderful. Why do you want to go to Bible school? Well, I want to learn, I, I want to learn theology. I want to learn more about Jesus. I said, okay, you can go if Jesus told you to go. But I can teach you theology if you feel that's why you want to go. He said, okay, you can teach me theology. 
And then I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> so I got this book uh, by Wayne Grudem, Systematic Theology. Anyone ever read that? 1,100 pages. 1,100 pages. Now, I'd studied that, you know, a long time ago. So I said, okay, Stacy, every Tuesday, we're going to have breakfast. Once a week, you take a chapter. There's 52 chapters in Systematic Theology. Study it. Summarize it. And send me a summary every week. Then we'll have breakfast, and we'll talk about it. No work for me. I get food. Win-win. He learns theology. I get breakfast. Love it. We did this for one year, every Tuesday morning, and he went through the entire systematic theology, and he studied it, and he read the Bible scriptures in each one. He summarized it. Stacy, a few years later, came on to eldership, and just a few months ago, two months ago, he's now leading one of our sites. He's 29. Amen? Who's 30 and below? I'm talking to you. Are you, re- are you ready to read systematic theology? Are you ready to, to apply yourself to some scripture? Apply yourself to something that's a little bit, uh, it's deep, it's, it's harder for a full year. Amen? You ready? Let's do it. Stacy then, a couple of years after him and I met every week, he met, he had two 18-year-olds, Danny and Noah, who were friends of his, 18 And they were showing a hunger for the Lord. Not a lot of wisdom yet. They were 18, but a deep hunger for the Lord. And so what did Stacy do? Well, he learned from me, let's have breakfast every Tuesday. So they had coffee every Thursday. So every Thursday morning, they had coffee. Yeah, he's a full week, but it's good. And he started meeting every week with Danny and Noah for something like two or three years when they were 18. We just took those two through elders training with us. They're 22. Danny preaches regularly in our church. Noah preaches this Sunday, his first time, full message in the church. They lead meetings with us. They lead prayer meetings. They lead life groups because someone invested time in them and discipled them. Amen? Are you guys ready to do that? Friends, it takes deliberate time to invest into people and then you start risking with it. And when you disciple people, be deliberate, lean into tough topics. You don't just sit and have coffee and just, (laughs) that was funny. I saw that. (laughs) That was good. (laughs) Someone had a fright over there. But (laughs) If if you're starting a discipleship relationship, lean into difficult topics. Even the ones you don't understand, you can go do some studying about it and teach it and and unpack it and learn together. Challenge them. Give them assignments. Give them books. Teach them about hearing God's voice. We heard this yesterday. I think it was in the breakout. Alan, where's Alan? Teach people to hear God's voice. And when someone you're working with begins to learn to understand the voice of God and hear and recognize the voice of God, you got someone you can work with. you got someone you can work with and take to a nev- next level. There's 400 people at this equip. What if each one of you took one person or maybe two people, take six months at a time, and you ask them in your church, hey, can we walk a journey together? Can we, and even if you're 25, grab a 15-year-old or an 18-year-old. Can we do this journey together? And then a year from now, we're back at Equip, and you have to get a bigger venue then. Because now 400 more disciples have come along the journey, ready to learn and grow more in theology and understanding the voice of God and worshiping together. One person, one person, who's in your life? Who has God put in your life? When, God, when I was having this wrestle with God, where are the leaders? I'm drowning. God said, make them. I'm like, that's going to take so long. Make them. Start tomorrow. Look at someone on your phone today. Who is that person in your life that is showing some kind of hunger, some kind of desire to grow more? Ask them if you can meet with them every week. Could you do that? You're going to change the nature of all of your churches when we begin to actually disciple people. Training for us has looked differently with Gen Zers, especially. 
It used to be maybe that you could say, okay, we're going to do leaders training. You guys remember 20 years ago, 30 years ago? Okay, leaders training, Thursday nights, and then everyone comes. Anyone's experience here? Right back in the day. It doesn't happen anymore. I used to do that, and then every Thursday night afterwards, I'm depressed. (laughs) Nobody wants to come. I don't know what to do. So we decided, let's create a leadership training course. And then I went to people. I say, oh, Ella, there's such a gifting on your life. I would like you to come to our leadership development because we want to invest in you. And I meant it. you got to mean it. And they come along with me. We're going to do a one-year residency, leadership development. Would you want to come if someone invites you that way? Right? Someone's identifying you, and they're inviting you on a journey. There's a clear plan. And so we started doing that, and we've been uh, uh, training so many people by our leaders Each inviting two or three people saying, there's something on your life. Man, you're prophetic. I see it in you. Um, God showed me. So come along with us. We're going to learn how to be prophetic. We're going to learn what the prophets of all do. Amen? Each of us, each one of you have influence in your life. Is there someone that listens to you in your church? Not a rhetorical question. Yes or no? There is. There's someone in your life. There's someone who's there because you're there. And God wants you to see the gold in them and call it out and bring them along a discipleship journey with them. Amen. Third thing. Are you ready? How are we doing, translators? Okay? Too fast? Uh, okay, Okay. Good. Third one is this. Power ministry. Power ministry. I didn't have a better way to put it. Here it is. Jesus said, Luke 4, 18, the Spirit of God has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed. An old NCMI value, be naturally supernatural and supernaturally natural. In other words, don't be weird. Is that okay? Don't be weird. But friends, this is the ministry. Back to Luke chapter 4. This is the ministry of Jesus. And Jesus is still ministering today. Jesus wants us to preach to the poor, preach the gospel, preach the good news. Jesus wants us to heal the sick. Do you believe the sick can be healed today still? Amen? The sick can be healed today. We see it every week in our church. People are being healed from all sorts of sickness, and people be, are being delivered in our church. Now, I, was, I grew up in South Africa. I understood deliverance in South Africa, right? It happens there a lot. Then I got to America, and I've lived there as long as I lived in Africa. And people say, well, this is the first world. Uh, yeah, deliverance doesn't happen here. Not true. Not true. People are getting delivered all the time. Why are we even surprised? The ministry of Jesus was to set at liberty those who are captive, those who are bound. And we are surrounded by people who are bound up and hurt and broken. Our first response is to go to the doctor. When to, our first response as Christians should be to go to prayer, to go to the elders Let someone pray for me first. Why do we start at the doctors? I thank the Lord for doctors. They've saved our lives over and over and over. But as Christians filled with the Spirit of God, amen? Young people want to see this kind of authenticity. They want to see that the God of the Bible is still the God of today. So preach passionately. Preach powerfully. Let's see healing. Friends, let's make an opportunity in our churches weekly, if possible, for people to get healed. From emotional, physical, spiritual hurts. The amount of abuse that our young people especially are walking with today is unbelievable. We're on an American college and the the media is all over the statistics of how many uh, sexual abuse victims there are in our colleges today. Guess what? They're in your church. They're in your church, and they're walking around with deep trauma. And if we're too afraid to go into the deep, dark spaces, how are these people going to find healing? 
you heard this yesterday, but it's such an experience of ours. The amount of people, young people especially, caught up in anxiety and depression is off the charts. It's unbelievable how many young people are caught up in suicidal thoughts, cutting, depression. And if, if you don't know about it in your church, friends, they're just hiding it from you. There are too many people caught up. And if we are afraid of the power ministries, friends, we're missing a major opportunity to minister to people in our church. Leaders. I say this with all respect in my heart, but if you're uncomfortable with this, this, this topic, get comfortable with it. Get comfortable with it. The time is too short for us to be playing games and just doing great theological teachings. And if you're uncomfortable, guess what? You're in a team. We're in a team. There's a whole NCMI team here of people in this country and in Africa and in America who would love to come and minister and help you grow, not to come and be the deliverance man of the hour, but to come teach each of you leaders. Elders, are you in this building? Are there any elders in this building? Are you comfortable with talking about deliverance and praying for it? You don't have to be the deliverance guy. You just have to be a Jesus guy full of the Holy Spirit. Amen? Amen. You guys uncomfortable? Good. I, 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 we, we need to be a little bit uncomfortable. Here's my church growth strategy. If you want to see your church grow, do what Jesus did and say what Jesus said. End of story. Amen? Let me talk about the last one here. Risking and empowering. Risking and empowering. Now, this is hard. This is hard. NCMI has, has got such a long legacy of people risking great and big things. We had dinner last night with Alex and Michelle, and they were telling us about coming to uh, Utrecht. And I'm like, well, who did you know here? Uh, well, no one. I'm like, well, how did you pick it? Well, the Lord told us. I'm like, okay, so then you came 16, 17 years ago. I'm like, okay, how did you build a church? Well, we just came and we started meeting and then people would come and have coffee and we had coffee before and coffee after. And I'm like, this, you're crazy. You're crazy. Who would do that? Who would do that? Who would just go to a new city and go set up shop and go make coffee and tell people about Jesus? What kind of faith that took? What kind of faith that took? This is the legacy of our churches here. Great faith. But friends, let that not be your testimony from the past. Let that be your current reality. Great faith that we walk in. We need to learn to begin to risk and empower our young people. Oftentimes we... We get into a leadership position, and then we begin to raise the bar of the entry requirements into that position. Yeah? And before you know it, you wouldn't have gotten into that leadership position <laughs> where, where you to start where you were. we got to keep risking. we got to keep risking. Now, you don't risk with heart and character. Right? So heart and character, we need to be on the same page. And I'll add what Alan said yesterday. You want to know that people have learning and are, are hearing the voice of God. To me, that's such a sign that there's a hunger for someone, especially young, who wants to grow more in the things of the Lord. So heart and character, you want to be on the same page. But skill, friends, you can learn all the skills. You can learn it. So let's begin to risk it. Discipleship. In today's language, is more like apprenticeship. Yeah. Apprenticeship. Is, a, is apprenticeship a word here in Europe? In, in the trades in America, uh, especially in, electri you know, you want to be a plumber or an electrician or something, it's not so much about how much schooling you do. It's more about getting a good uh, apprenticeship. Right, So you're going and you're a plumber and you're like, okay, we got to change this toilet. And you, you as, the, as the plumber, change the toilet and your apprentice looks at you changing the toilet. Yes? Step one. Step two, okay, next toilet. I'm the, I'm the, the, the boss. I'm going to stand there. Young man, young woman, change the toilet. And you start and you're like, oh, no, 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 no. You, nope, nope, this, then that. And you're helping, you're giving direction. 
The third time, the third toilet. Okay, no, you can do it. I don't need to say anything. The fourth toilet. Well, I'm not even there. You, you know how to do it. We're walking with people along the skills of leading. Amen? That's, that's, that's discipleship. That's apprenticeship. Some examples of where we have tried to uh, use opportunities to teach people to hear the voice of God, to get comfortable with leading, to get comfortable with acting out, is leading meetings on, on Sunday mornings. Uh, MC leading, what do you call it here? Okay. Okay. Um, so my wife does a great job of this, of helping people learn how to lead a meeting. Now, I understand we, we teach and we learn that elders lead meetings, right? But an elder can also delegate authority to someone and stand next to them and with them and help them learn and grow as they go along, this, uh, along the way. Is that okay? So half of, of, of learning to lead a meeting is learning how to hold a microphone, you know? Sometimes a new preacher comes, and they've got the microphone over here, and they're sharing a fantastic word, and no one can hear them because they're so nervous, like you couldn't hear me. They're sharing a fantastic word, but no one can hear them. They don't know how to hold the microphone. As simple things as that. Okay, friends, we had one guy who started preaching, and when he started preaching, he's like this, and the Lord said this, and that, you know, and I'm like, stand still. <laughs> You're distracting me, and we're... We're, we're teaching people how to get comfortable standing in front of other people leading. Very simple examples. But what do you have in your hands right now? Where are the opportunities where you can help? MC, I think, or leading a meeting is one of the more difficult tasks of learning how to hear what the Holy Spirit says and then helping translate that into what next steps are. You want to try it? You're going to risk it. And then they're going to say something weird. And then you're going to jump up on stage and say, oh, that's, that's nice. Come, here's what we believe. And, and everyone's going to laugh and we're going to be fine. And Jesus is still coming back. Amen? It's all going to be okay. We, we do the same thing with preaching. You know, it's, it's one thing to throw someone into a sermon and say, here's 30, 40 minutes, Go. Some of those are not so fun. So we said, okay, 15-minute sermons. We'll do two 15-minute sermons, and then we'll walk with you for a few weeks to help you hear the voice of the Lord. And then show me your notes. And I'm like, okay, you've got your entire theology in this note. You only have 15 minutes. Let me show you how we can bring it down. And you're training people to get to the Word, hear from the Lord, get to the Word, interpret it, apply it. And then people sitting in the church it's only 15 minutes if it's bad. <laughs> but usually we extend so much grace to these young people as they're growing. And usually it's fantastic. Amen? And then sometimes there's a few oopsies that happens. You understand oopsies? Uh, oops. Oh, no. You can't say that. One young man got up on stage and he was so excited. God wants to burn a fire in your heart and we got to get rid of all the, and he said a word. Uh, and and, and we got to get, burn the mm, out of your life and burn. The, I was like, stop. <laughs> so, so I got up and I said, oh, that's fantastic. Oh, so good. Lord, would you purify our hearts? Get off. And, uh, and, uh, but guess what? The church is still there. And everyone saw the fire in this young man's hearts, and they were encouraged to lean into what the Lord has for them. Amen? If you're under 30, friends, I hope someone over 30 or someone in leadership is going to help walk with you along this. If you're over 30, I want to encourage you, take some risks. Ask the Lord to show you people with gold in their hearts. Invest some time in them. And then you've got to start risking it with people. The longer you hold on to people, the less they're getting developed. And the more your church is just getting older and older and more and more irrelevant. Amen. Us growing up and getting older, Kathy has to now start taking the hair off my ears. I don't know how that happens. So she sits there with a tweezer. And next thing you know, in my mind, I'm still 23. And she's sitting there plucking hair off my ears. It just happens. It's not the devil. <laughs> the, 
that was not in my notes. <laughs> as, as I close, as I close, I want to remind you of something. The disciples that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, picked were estimated to be between 15 and 18 years old. Now, maybe you can say, well, 15 and 18 is different these times than those times. Okay, fine. Make it 22 to 25. Either way, it's younger than 25. And he decided to leave his entire mission to 18-year-olds. Yet we make people wait till they're 30 or 35 before they're allowed to lead a small group. No one in this room, but just in general. I want to invite you. Let's, let's, uh, this generation is an all or nothing. And, and if you've got them, nurture them. Stoke the fire in their hearts. Invest in them. Risk with them. Have fun with them. And guess what? Learn from them as well. Amen.